Well, good morning. Hope you are well today and are excited to be here and ready to worship together. As we begin this morning, I have a few announcements for you. And the first one is that you have an insert there in your bulletin uh, for our song of the uh, week. Uh, so be thinking about that one, reading up on that. And also, if you'll notice on the inside of your bulletin, besides your catechism, which we'll come back to, uh, there is a note there about the Lord's Day evening service tonight not being held. And I just want to... All right. So, on the back of your bulletin, you'll notice our new blog post is online, and uh, it concerns the third statement of the Apostles' Creed, He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit. And so, take a moment to read that this week. Christmas in July continues. And uh, so, I would uh, invite you to look on that list and see if there's things that you could give to support uh, that ministry to uh, local kids in need of school supplies and hygiene supplies for the upcoming school year. Also, don't forget our church library, uh, wonderful church library. Take advantage of having it. And also, if you're on the documents or nominating committee, uh, we're going to be getting in contact with you soon. We need to set up some meetings here in the near future. Uh, we're coming to time of the year, we're going to have to have some nominations. And we need to work on the bylaws. Besides that, a couple of other updates. As you all know, we've had a lot of people uh, having medical treatments and surgeries and checkups and stuff as of late. So be praying for all of our uh, people. And lastly, there are some cards out on the table in the lobby. You may have noticed them the last couple of weeks. I've been keeping some with me. Our good friend Ben, uh, he has started a website called uh, whatisthegoodnews.org. And so, uh, these cards are out there. You can give them to people as a uh, sort of like a digital track. They can go to that website and read up and learn about the gospel. So, just wanted to make you aware of those. They're on that front table out there. And besides that, let's get ready to worship today. And we're going to begin with our psalm for this week, Psalm 59. To the chief musician, set to, do not destroy, a miktam of David when Saul sent me in. And they watched the house in order to kill him. Deliver me from my enemies, O my God. Defend me from those who rise up against me. Deliver me from the workers of iniquity. And save me from bloodthirsty men. For they look, they, for look, they lie in wait for my life. The mighty gather against me, not for my transgression, nor for my sin, O Lord. They run and prepare themselves through no fault of mine. Awake to help me, and behold, You therefore, you therefore, O Lord God of hosts, the God of Israel, awake to punish all the nations. Do not be merciful to any wicked transgressors, Selah. At evening they return, they growl like a dog, and go all around the city. Indeed, they belch with their mouth. Swords are in their lips, for they say, who hears? But you, O Lord, shall laugh at them. You shall have all the nations in derision. I will wait for you, O you his strength, for God is my defense. My God of mercy shall come to meet me. God shall let me see my desire on my enemies. Do not slay them, lest my people forget. Scatter them by your power and bring them down, O Lord, our shield. For the sin of their mouth and the words of their lips, let them even be taken in their pride. And for the cursing and lying which they speak, Consume them in wrath, consume them, and they may not be. And let them know that God rules in Jacob to the ends of the earth, Selah. And at evening they return, they growl like a dog, and go all around the city. They wander up and down for food and howl if they are not satisfied. But I will sing of your power. Yes, I will sing aloud of your mercy in the morning, for you have been my defense and refuge in the day of my trouble. To you, O oh my strength, I will sing praises, for God is my defense, my God of mercy. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time to come together as your people. We thank you for uh, just this ability to start the, the service in the scriptures and to continue them later in the scriptures, to pray and to worship to you, uh, to worship you, Father, to lift high the name of Christ your Son, our Savior. Father, as we gather today, I pray that this would be a time of joy, of thanksgiving, of praise, but that as we come to the Word today, it would be a time also of thoughtfulness. For the Scripture we come to today is a stern and solemn warning 
that we be mindful of things that matter, that we make sure that we are in the faith lest we drift away. Father, I pray that we would realize that such warnings are needed to awaken us, to shake us up sometimes, that we might hear the truth of the gospel and our utter hopelessness without it. Father, today we lift high the name of Jesus in whom we have salvation. It's in his name we gather and pray and for his glory. Amen. One final thing I want to mention before I uh, step down here is that letter that I promised you. Um, I have it today. We didn't get back in time for me to get it out this week. So I said, well, we'll just hand it out to church on Sunday. So you'll receive it on the way out today. Anyway, thank you all very much. Good morning. If you would, please stand as we sing our opening hymn this morning, Hymn 284, At the Cross, and we will sing all five verses of Hymn 284.
repertory hymn this morning will be hymn 154, Oh the Deep, Deep Love, and we will sing all three verses of hymn 154. Let us pray. Father in heaven, what a blessing again it is to be here today, to sing these great songs of the faith, to celebrate the deep, deep love that we have in Christ Jesus. Father, as we come to this time of the service, we recognize that every gift that we have comes from you, and that you call upon us to give back a portion of the blessings we've received for your work in this world. And so, Father, we offer now our tithes and offerings in honor of Christ Jesus, that his name might be magnified and his gospel might go to the very ends of the earth for his glory. It's in his name we pray. Amen.
We come now to the time of our catechism, and it is found inside your bulletin. We come to question 62. You all know the drill. What is required in the ninth commandment? The answer, the ninth commandment requires the maintaining and promoting of truth between man and man and of our own and our neighbor's good name, especially in witness bearing. Amen. All right, we come to our text for today, and it is found in Hebrews chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. Therefore, we must give the more earnest heed to the things we have heard, lest we drift away. For if the word spoken through angels proved steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? Which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord, and was confirmed by us, or to us, by those who heard Him. God also bearing witness both with signs and wonders, with various miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit, according to His own will. Amen. The hymn we'll be singing right now is hymn 119 in your hymnal, There is a Higher Throne. Uh, Katie and I are doing it as a special, but again, if you guys know it, uh, feel free to sing with us, or if you want to follow along, you can, but we'll be singing it as a congregation next Sunday.
Amen. All right, if you have your Bibles, be turning to Hebrews chapter 2. And we finally made it out of the first chapter. We'll thank the Lord for these small victories, won't we? All right, as we come to this second chapter, it's a uh, very important and timely message, I believe, not only in its original application uh, to the hearers and receivers of this message, but also to us. Uh, There's always uh, the importance to think about if we truly stand in the faith, but I think there's another way we can think about drifting away that's also important, and I want to think about both those things today. If you wonder uh, what this text is really going to be pointing to, we're only looking at verse 1 today, uh, but it's in the context of these first four verses that make an argument that the first chapter has been leading up to. You can see that because the first word here is, therefore. And as we said, you know, every uh, seminary professor will tell you, whenever you see therefore, look back and see what it's there for, right? So we know this. So what the author is saying is, based on what I've told you in chapter 1, he wouldn't have worded it that way. There weren't chapter divisions uh, when he wrote it. But he would say the things that were before this are the basis for what I'm now telling you. And so we need to think about this. Well, what has he said? What's the logic of what he's already told us? Well, he's already told us that Jesus is the glorious Christ, the perfect prophet, the greatest high priest, the enthroned king of all, that he is the savior, the sustainer, glorious creator. He says that all the old Uh, Testament prophets, as glorious as they were, as great as they were, pale in comparison to him. They were just men. He is God incarnate. He's greater than the angels. And that seemed like a long stretch that didn't make a lot of sense. And hopefully last Sunday morning, we cleared it up a little bit by looking at one of the functions of angels as mediators. And that's going to be the point here of verses two, or excuse me, uh, chapter two, verses one through four. The angels were mediators. They mediated, in some sense, the first covenant. This is not fully explained to us uh, in the Scriptures. It is mentioned, but it's not fully explained why this was necessary. I think we can figure it out as we come to that text shortly, but it won't be today. But again, they were mediators. But if these angels, which are created servants, are mediators of an old covenant, how much more glorious is the new covenant, which is mediated by God Himself, Christ So again, all of this is being pointed out to us. Angels are servants. That's not to be dismissive of them. But Jesus is God's only begotten Son. While prophets and angels are worthy of honor, they are not objects of worship. Jesus is. So again, all of this points to where the author is going today. And so I'm going to read it again. Focus, if you will, on that first verse in particular. Therefore... We must give the more earnest heed to the things we have heard, lest we drift away. For if the word spoken through angels proved steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed to us by those who heard him? God also bearing witness both with signs and wonders, with various miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit, according to to his own will. Now there is a lot there in those first four verses of this chapter. So we'll spend a little time, not as much as in chapter one, but it's important that we walk through these verses and see in depth what is being said here. But today we're going to look at verse one because there is an important message here about drifting away. So in regard to that, I want to look at two points. First of all, a call to pay attention, a call to pay attention. And second of all, a warning against drifting away. So beginning first with this idea of a call to pay attention, as I just mentioned, the text starts with therefore or for this reason, both of which say the reasoning is founded upon what has been said in chapter 1. Now, based on all that has been stated just now, you should do what the author is about to say or consider what the author is about to reveal. So what does he say? What does he reveal? Well, look with me. He says, therefore, based on what I've just said, we must give the more more earnest heed. The more earnest heed. In other words, we must pay greater attention to what we've heard. We must pay greater attention to what we've heard. 
Now, the necessity of that action is seen clearly in the Greek text. It is clearly saying it is of necessity that we do this. Not you should do it. Not you probably ought to do it. You must. You need to do what he is saying. You need to give greater attention, supreme attention, to what you have already heard. Now, it's a call uh, to make sure that those who hear this message in this letter recognize the importance of heeding the things that they've been taught in the past. Now, what does he mean by this? He means the apostolic traditions. He means the gospel, the message of Jesus Christ, the very things he's been hinting at in the first chapter. Pay greater attention to those things. Set your mind upon these things. Focus on them. Think about them. Meditate on them. This is his message. Now, the question is, is he saying this? Who's he saying this to? Let's think of it this way. He's saying this to a group of Jewish believers who are thinking about returning to the Jewish side of the spectrum, if you will. They say, well, we're still worshiping the same God, but Judaism's a little safer. We'll go back to the temple or, or the synagogue and we'll disassociate with the church. We're still worshiping the same God. So there's a safe harbor there, but uh, we won't be under persecution. Now, that's who it's being spoken to. So when he says, pay more earnest heed to the gospel message, he is not saying to do that disregarding the Old Testament message. Now, we can know that because the way this author argues this text is to use the Old Testament over and over again. What he's saying is, if you pay more earnest heed to the Old Testament, it'll lead you to Christ. And if you may, uh, pay more earnest heed to what we've been teaching you, it'll lead you to Christ. Either way, observing, focusing on, paying earnest heed to the Word of God will lead you to Christ. For Christ is the end and purpose of all the Word of God. He is Himself the Word of God. And so it necessarily must lead to Him. And so again, a uh, couple of things that we need to think about here we should not ever pit the Old Testament and New Testament against each other. Ever. Ever do that. It's Again, the argument of Hebrews is if you look to the Old Testament, you see it points to Christ. This is not a unique argument to Hebrews. If you walk through, in fact, the, uh, the blog post we just put up about the birth of Christ, the incarnation of Christ, is all about how the Old Testament pointed to this. The angel comes and says, To Joseph, this is in fulfillment of what Isaiah said. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bring forth a son, and you shall call, his name shall be called Emmanuel. He says he should be called Jesus. He will save his people from his sins. That's what he tells Mary. Again, uh, it's based on the Old Testament scriptures. All of this is proofed, if you will, in the Old Testament. Paul says uh, to the Bereans, if you question my message, that's fine. Go back to the scrolls. Go back and consider what they say. Am I accurately reflecting the testimony of the Old Testament Scriptures? If I'm not, disregard me. But if I am, and I am, you better heed what I'm saying. Likewise, the author of this letter says, listen, I just heed what's been said. Think about it. Consider the message of Christ. How does it correspond to the Old Testament Scriptures? If you do that, it will point to you that Christ is the Redeemer of the people of God. Now, that means that we ought to consider these texts as well. When we walk through the the passages of Hebrews, we recognize so many Old Testament quotations. We need to take our time and look at them. Because the author says, the inspired author says, these Old Testament texts point to Jesus. They point to realities that we need to understand. We can never be a people who claim, well, the Old Testament is passed away in some way or isn't important, uh, that we only need to focus on the New Testament. This is never said in the Scriptures. In fact, uh, Paul tells Timothy that the Old Testament Scriptures are profitable. He recognizes that was the Bible they had. Look at those Scriptures. They will point you to Christ. They are the foundation, and they reveal to us the will of God and what He is like and so many other things. So again, uh, it would serve us well to go back to the first question we spoke of, uh, who are the people to whom this a letter is written. Who are they? Jewish believers. Jewish believers. The people who have professed faith in Christ, they've made a profession of faith in Christ, and yet they seem to be moving away from Christ. Moving away. To them this author says, 
Very importantly, heed more carefully what you've heard. You've already heard it. It's important that you recognize you've heard the message, but you need to heed the message. You need to listen to the message. There is no safe harbor apart from this message. This message is the fulfillment of all the Old Testament promises of God. So in that context, they need to stay focused on the apostolic message, the gospel message, the message that Jesus Christ and Him alone is God's Redeemer, the Redeemer for the people of God. Now, further, they're being instructed in a message, I believe, here that kind of sum, it's a summation, if you will, of all of biblical theology. In fact, as you walk through Hebrews, and I've tried to make this point, there is a heavy dose of biblical theology. The overarching message of the Scriptures, in much the same way Romans has this approach, Hebrews has this approach as well. And so we're going to see that over time, over weeks and months, we're going to see this play out. And it's going to be important even into what we're looking at today. But again, uh, as we think about a people who are calling themselves, professing themselves to be Christians, there is a serious warning here, isn't there? There's a warning that they pee, uh, heed the, more, uh, the most earnest heed, if you will, to the message they've received because there is a danger that they face if they fail to do this. Now, this is a reminder to the people of God that we must be vigilant and mindful of the truth to which we are called. We must give the most earnest heed to the teachings that we have received. And my friends, as we think about this, it's important to recognize that many in churches today have never received these messages and truths. Many churches do not preach the gospel, do not preach the scriptures. A person in our own fellowship has told me that the previous church that they were at, one Sunday morning, the sermon was from a book on golf. Literally, they exposited a chapter of a book on golf. My friends, that should bother us greatly that that's going on in our churches today. And yet it is. It's a great problem. How can people give proper attention to what they've never heard? That is the reason we are called to preach the Word of God, to preach the gospel of Christ, because our people need to hear it. But if you have heard it, the author of Hebrews is telling you every bit as much as he's telling these early Christians, you must heed careful attention. To what is said. You must listen carefully to the message that you've received because there's a great danger if you do not. And that brings me to my second point this morning the danger of drifting away. That's the danger it's mentioned here. Look at verse one. Therefore, we must give the more earnest heed to the things we have heard. Why? Lest we drift away. The danger is that we will drift away. Now, brothers and sisters, please hear this this morning. There is a danger of drifting away from the truth. A danger of drifting away from the truth. Now, let me park there for just one moment. Because you might ask, well, don't you hold to the historic doctrine of the perseverance of the saints? And I would say, yes, of course I do. Of course I do. The Bible tells us that that is true. But you say, well, then why would you say that we can drift away from the truth? And I say, because the Word of God tells us that we can It tells you clearly right here, there is a threat to drift away from the truth. Well, what does this mean? What does this mean? What is this stern warning given? Well, let me start by saying this. It's one of seven warnings like this given in this letter. There are several serious warnings given to the recipients of this letter that are warnings to them about not drifting away, walking away, running away. In this case, the wording is drifting away. And I think that's very important wording. Now, it's not our purpose to exposit verses 2 through 4 this morning. uh, But if you were to, you would notice that it ties back into what I've been trying to say is where we were going in chapter 1, which is about this mediation of the old covenant by the angels. Just look at it again. For if the word spoken through angels proved steadfast and every transgression and disobedience received a just reward, how shall we escape? If we neglect so great a salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed to us by those who heard him. God also bearing witness both with signs and wonders, with various miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit, according to his own will. Now, my friends, what this is tying together is this theme here of Christ, first of all, as a greater prophet than the Old Testament prophets. 
but also a greater mediator than the angels who mediated the first covenant. Again, I'm going to withhold going into that too much because we're going to go into that in the future, but it does speak something of the Old Testament in comparison to the New Testament in that the Old Covenant needed to be double mediated. Now, that's going to tell us something about Christ because there was mediation on the heavenly side, God mediating through angels, and then on the human side, it's mediated through Moses on behalf of the people. But now, it's mediated solely in Christ because He is both God and man. We're going to look at the importance of that as we move forward. But for today, recognize this argument. Servants mediated before, now the Son mediates. Christ is a greater and more glorious mediator, just as His covenant is greater and more glorious than the Old Covenant. We'll get to this in future weeks, but I always draw your attention to 2 Corinthians, in which Paul says the glory of the New Covenant is such that it makes the Old Covenant as if it had no glory at all. He's not saying it had no glory. He's saying, but the New Covenant is so glorious that it dims the light, if you will, of the Old Covenant slightly. Still glorious. The law is glorious. What God did at Sinai, glorious. But Christ Jesus is completely glorious. This covenant is the fullness of glory. And so again, he's making this comparison. And he's saying to a people who are thinking about moving away from the new covenant toward the old covenant, wait just a minute, be careful. Heed what's been taught to you, lest you drift away into danger. Drift away into danger. My friends, that wording of drifting away is powerful wording. It's the idea of just slowly, incrementally moving along, incrementally moving along. The picture that Paul is likely giving us is of a ship coming to harbor. The captain and the crew focus on something else for a time, and the next thing they know, they've drifted right past the safety of the harbor. Now, In the originals, it seems like most commentators think this means they've missed it. It's gone. It's missed. So again, this is a serious warning, a serious warning that we need to think about. How could we fail to heed so serious a warning? How could they fail to heed so serious a warning by not simply heeding the word that's been given to them, heeding the message that's been given to them? They came so close, he's saying, there's a danger of coming so close to the safety of the harbor and yet missing it. That's an image that is both tragic and serious. How many people have come so close to the harbor and drifted away? Drifted away. Countless. Countless. This is what this message is telling us. Countless people have uh, made a profession of faith may not have been in possession of faith, but they made a profession of faith. They heard the Word of God, received the Word of God. They fellowshiped amongst the people of God. And yet they drifted away from the safety of the harbor, never having accepted Christ, never having put their faith truly in Christ. This is tragic, a startling and frightening truth. It's intended to be. Martin Lloyd-Jones said of this very passage, that it's like a medical doctor. And if there's anyone who would understand being a medical doctor, it's Martin Lloyd-Jones, who was a very promising uh, physician before giving it all up to serve the Lord as a minister. And he said, it's like a doctor. A doctor comes to his patient and says, "Uh, you have a a malady, you have a a problem, you need a course of treatment. And the person doesn't want it, so they say, "Uh, eh. And so the doctor says, no, you you really need it. And they say, eh, I eh, don't really need it. I don't want it. Then he says, the doctor then will raise the stakes. He's not lying. He's just laying out the danger that you face if you don't heed his warning. He says, if you don't treat this, it could kill you, whatever the case might be. He makes it stark and clear that there is a danger in not listening to his warning. In the same way, the author of Hebrews says, I know that your local pastors and ministers and elders have told to you there's a danger in walking away from the faith. There's a danger in walking back into Judaism. There's a danger in returning to the synagogue and leaving the church. But you're not heeding it. And so let me put it in the starkest terms possible. You are in danger. 
you are in danger of drifting away. Drifting away to your own loss. To your own loss. Now, it's an attempt, if you will, to make clear the consequences of their action. Along that line of thinking, let me try to summarize what I think is being said here because it is important to think about it rightly. Now, uh, it's going to take us going through weeks and months ahead to gain all this biblical theology that the author of Hebrews is setting up to explain this to us. But most of you know the Bible. And so you'll recognize, I think, this parallel. And then I'm going to ask you to follow along over the months ahead to see if this is not what he's arguing. He says, you as Jewish believers know the Old Testament story. You know it. And you know that we serve a good God, a powerful, almighty God, a gracious God. And there was an Old Testament people who called themselves the people of God, who were called the people of God by God. This is just basic biblical theology, isn't it? Israel. And all the people amongst the Israelites called themselves the people of God individually. But was it true? Paul argues in Romans it is not true, right? It is not true. Not all those people were truly the people of God. They weren't of the faith of Abraham. And so, likewise, here the author says, God by His mighty arm rescued the Israelites out of slavery in Egypt. And He took them through the wilderness. And yet what happened? These people of God rebelled against God. Rebelled against His leaders, rebelled against Him, complained, were miserable, unhappy, constantly complaining about God, rebelling against Him. And what is the outcome for them? They died in the wilderness. They did not make it to the land of promise. Now you're going to see this throughout Hebrews. This imagery is used over and over again. There is a rest for the people of God. There was a picture of it in the Old Testament as they came to Canaan. There was a rest for the people of God. But not all of the people who claimed to be the people of God made it there. Likewise, he says, you claim to be of the people of God. You claim to be a Christian. You claim to be one who puts his faith in Jesus Christ. And God has saved all those in Christ from the power of slavery to sin and death. And he's bringing them into glory. He's bringing them into the land of promise, into the promised rest. But be careful. Lest your true colors are shown and you're not faithful but a rebel who never placed faith in Christ. Now, how is this author saying that would be borne out? You turn from the truth. You turn from Christ. It is not the start that matters, the Bible tells us over and over again. For many make the start and fall away. Is that not given to us in the parable of the sower? The seeds land on four parts of the ground, don't they? One the path, one stony ground, one thorny ground, one good soil. Three of those don't make it. Jesus said, those who persevere to the end shall be saved. What he's saying is, those who are truly of the faith, those who have been born again, will persevere. Now, what I think he's saying here is, be very careful. Lest your failure to heed what has been said is evidence that you are not amongst us. Very much like what John says, those who went out from us showed they were never Of us. They were never of us. I think there's a stark warning warning to grab them by the collar and shake them and say, Do you consider what this might mean about you for you to walk away from Christ? Have you considered what it's saying and what the consequences are? Brothers and sisters, there is a danger to drifting away because it can be imperceptible imperceptible. That's the beauty of that imagery. And the frightening thing about that imagery is that drifting away is something that happens slowly and in tiny little steps. You make rational uh, ideas and rational statements of like, well, I'm not being unfaithful to God. I'm being just as faithful to God. Um, why, Why can't I just focus on the Old Testament? Why can't I just go to synagogue instead of church? All these small statements and you think you're standing right where you were and you've drifted completely away. Completely away. For 
The way I think about this, I'm sure many of you probably have already thought about it this exact way. When you're at the beach, you get in the ocean, you're having fun. I remember this oftentimes when the kids were little and we'd get to go to the beach and we'd be in the water and of course we'd be playing and having a great time for 30 minutes or 45 minutes. You don't even recognize the time that slipped by. And the next thing you know, you turn back to the shore where you think you entered the water and it's nowhere to be found. You're hundreds of yards down the face of the beach, aren't you? As every time you lifted your feet, the current moved you an inch or two and you never even knew it. I remember as a child, the first time I experienced that, I was a little bit frightened. I was like, where did my parents go? Where did they go? They were right there. And then I think it was a a building or something. I said, oh, wait a minute, that's way down there. How did I get down here? But that's the thing. I didn't recognize it was happening as it was happening. That's the problem of drifting away. It can happen so slightly and slowly that you don't even recognize you're not standing where you once stood. And the author of Hebrews is applying this to salvation to people who have made a profession of faith in Christ and yet are nowhere near where they stood when they said they believed in Christ. They've drifted away, and they're in danger of missing the harbor. And he's saying, you may have a minute or two, maybe five minutes left before you can, while you can still steer that ship back into the harbor, you're going to miss it if you don't. Don't take another step. Stop right where you're at. Hey, careful heed, earnest heed to the things that have been taught to you. Consider it before you continue in the path that you're on. Now, clearly that's a message of warning about being close to the kingdom of God and missing it altogether. That's his point here. But I also think there's another way we need to think about drifting away. We can drift away as churches We can drift away uh, in our walk with Christ, maybe not uh, as far as we're talking about here, maybe not into unbelief, but I mean, we cannot be where we once were in terms of our Christian walk. You know, one of the things that is true about the walk of a Christian is we have to be intentional about it. If we don't set aside time for prayer and for the study of God's Word, we won't do it. It's just reality. Uh, very rarely will you see someone, unless they are a seasoned Christian who is uh, just recognizing the importance of this, who will say, turn off the television, I need to study my Bible. Usually the television's on, you're going to stay watching the television. If you're occupied by other things, you're going to stay occupied by other things. You see, what it is telling us is we need to be intentional or we too can drift away. Many people will say this, they'll They'll say, I don't understand what's happened in my Christian walk. I used to feel so close to the Lord, and yet somehow I don't feel that way anymore. And if you say, well, let's talk about your walk of faith. What are you, how are you living your life compared to then? You'll almost invariably see, I don't spend time in prayer. I don't spend time in God's Word. The things that used to matter to me have kind of hit the back burner. I've been so focused on other things. And so there is a sense that we can drift away, not unto a lack of salvation as believers. We are saved in Christ, but we can drift away from where we once stood in our sanctification. And that's why we're told to be active in our sanctification. It's not possible without the Spirit of God, but we are required or called to be active in that sanctification, to not only be uh, reading and, and praying, but also to be putting to death sin in the flesh. That is a call that God has placed on us as believers to do by the power of the Spirit. And so we need to be recognizing of that. But also our churches can drift away. We can say, well, you know, uh, we've been in the Word, but uh, I'm going to do a series starting next month on scenes from movies. This is happening a lot in churches today. I'm going to show you a scene from some comedy or action film, and then I'm going to weave that into a story on discipleship. Why waste your time? Why waste your time? My friends, that doesn't benefit anybody. Let's go to the Word of God. It's been given to us, the very oracles of God. Let's start here and let's stay here. Now, that doesn't mean we can't use illustrations or stories, things like that from time to time, but the bulk of our sermon should be the Word of God. And that's what this author is saying. Pay attention. Give earnest heed to the things that you've heard. He's not saying some play that you saw in the Greek theater that somebody said, oh, that's like salvation. He says, stay in the Word of God. 
Pay attention to the Word of God. Stay in the Word of God. Listen to what it says. The testimony of the apostles, which you'll go to describe later as the witness of those who heard Jesus, who, who recognized Him, and how that was testified to by miracles and signs and gifts of the Holy Spirit that God had given them. So much to talk about in upcoming weeks. But my friends, part of what I've been saying I'm concerned about as of late in these discussions about the state of the church, I didn't deal with this much in the letter, uh, which you'll see today, but is a drift that I detect that's happening today in the way the gospel is being presented. And it's a serious thing to consider. Because again, people say, well, I don't see the problem. But if it's drifting, it won't be easy to see it first. And the next thing you know, 10 or 15 or 20 years down the road, you've drifted far away. You know, much of the social gospelness of, of this message that's being proclaimed today sounds very much like what the United Methodist Church was saying 20 or 30 years ago. Now look at where they're at. They said, oh, no, we just, this is a, a secular approach to doing the work of God. Well, my friends, here's the thing. God tells us how he wants us to do it as a church and the principles that we are supposed to live in and that we are reconciled through the gospel. We don't need Karl Marx to reconcile us to one another. We need Jesus to do that. We need Jesus to do that. And so, my friends, again, there is a drifting away that I'm concerned about, that we've been talking about, that we're seeing, just as in previous generations. In fact, I would argue in every generation there is a drifting away. In fact, I heard someone say one time that things always seem to drift away into unfaithfulness. It's only by standing fast on the Word of God and through sometimes uh, Reformation movements like we saw with Martin Luther that, that things stop for a moment, that trend toward error. You can see that in the ministry of Spurgeon who we often talk about as he stood against the downgrade in his day. Uh, you know, this idea of higher criticism which he recognized early on was going to be a poison pill in the gospel to undo it. Who would have believed then if you had told them at that time that 100 years from now the very churches that uh, he was trying to urge to not go that path are now ordaining uh, transgender people, homosexuals, everything. They have no doctrinal stance whatsoever, no fidelity to the Word of God. And he says, he said then at that time, it's going to lead to a bad end. I don't even know if he understood how bad an end it would end in. My friends, I think we need to recognize that this text is warning us about drifting even within the faith, to be careful, pay more earnest heed to the Word of God and what's been revealed to us, lest we also drift away. But again, I want to close with this because the main point is drifting away from salvation. Drifting away from salvation. It's a sad truth that there are many who will sit in churches regularly and hear the Word of God proclaimed. And show up at fellowship meals or whatever it may be. Be involved amongst the people of God, in the community of God, and yet never enter the safe harbor of faith. This author is saying, be careful. Pay attention. Give more earnest heed to the word to make sure that you don't pass it by. My friends, I would ask all of you to do that. In the faith, out of the faith, whatever the case, pay earnest heed to the Word of God and the warnings that it gives because there will be many people who do not enter that promised rest. Many people. Jesus said it that way, didn't He? The gate and the path to salvation is narrow. Few will find it. The way is broad and the gate broad that leads unto destruction and many will find it. Many versus few. Those are startling words. I would just ask you to take heed of this message, to give more earnest heed to the things that have been proclaimed, the things that this word says, that our only hope is in Christ Jesus, in the grace revealed by God in Christ as we place our faith in Him, who alone was able to take our sins upon Himself and give His life as an atonement for His people. My friends, I would ask that you give more earnest heed to the gospel of Jesus Christ. With that, let's close with a word of prayer. 
Heavenly Father, we thank you for this word. And Father, we thank you even for these warnings. Because they are necessary. Because so often in life we can become complacent. We can begin to just drift along. Not considering our position. Not considering what is true of us. And the next thing we know, we are far from where we once were. In the case of this text, Father, we recognize that there are some who come very close. They hear the gospel. They may even in some way acknowledge the truth that Jesus Christ exists, that he may have come into the world, that he uh, died on a cross. But they don't place faith in him. And that this word is telling us that would be like a, a ship coming so near the harbor of safety. And yet through a lack of paying careful attention are swept right by. Father, I pray that if there's a person here this morning who recognized their need of Christ, that they recognize today that, that they are drifting away from that safety of the gospel. But today they recognize that their only hope is in Christ. That it's not in their own works. It's not in anything they could do. They cannot be reconciled to you for they're a sinner as we all are. But that you sent your son, Jesus Christ, into this world to perfectly fulfill the law and to go to Calvary's cross to give his life as an atonement. And that if we place our faith in him and him alone, then we shall be saved. Father, I pray if there's a person here today who recognize their need of Jesus, that today would be the day. And Father, for the rest of us, I pray that we wouldn't miss an application of drifting in our own lives. That there is a way in which even the people of God, saved, born again, can drift away, not from salvation, but from what we're called to be, from the truths we're called to stand on. Father, I pray that we would be a people who would recognize that the answer is the same in both cases. That we are to pay earnest heed to what's been revealed to us. And Father, we are privileged to have the Word of God. To have the complete Scriptures. The complete canon. Father, I pray we would not take it for granted. But that we would recognize that we are being challenged to pay heed to what this Word says. And that wherever we turn in this wondrous book, Old Testament or New, it all points to Christ in whom and in whom alone salvation is made available. Father, help us to recognize that we should be thankful to have your word and that we should be in it and paying heed to what we find in this book. Father, we pray for your help to that end. In Christ's name and for his glory. Amen. If you would, please stand as we sing our closing hymn today, hymn 356, I Know Whom I Have Believed It, and we will sing the first verse of hymn 356.
Amen. Let us read our benediction now. It's found in Romans chapter 11, starting at verses, excuse me, starting at verse 33. O oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. For who has known the mind of the Lord, or who has become his counselor, or who has first given to him and it shall be repaid to him? For of him and through him and to him are all things, to whom be glory forever. Amen. Thank you all.